We're on. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. We are in Taos, New Mexico, um, and we are being hosted by the Helene Wurlitzer Foundation of New Mexico, uh, where we're in residence preparing Sylvain, our, our opera, which we hope those of you in Washington and New York will see on January 2nd and 3rd and on, in New York on, on January 7th. Um, I am here, this is a little bit different than our other online series, in that uh, our, me, uh, both I am here with our guest speakers in the same room, um, and I'd like to first introduce Maria Mondragon Valdez, who is from San Luis, and who is both an historian and a community activist, and um, just a really interesting person. Mm -hmm. And uh, similarly, um, I to my left is Tanya Hernandez Velasco, and Tanya is the director of our Sylvain, our opera, and she hails from Mexico City, and uh, and has will uh, Maria will be telling us a little about the history of San Luis, um, which inspired the setting of our Sylvain, and um, and Tanya will tell us a bit about her own filmmaking and the film in which. Uh, which inspired, which when I saw it, inspired me to ask her to direct Sylvain. Um, one of the, uh, we're always trying, you know, when we, uh, when we look at a new opera, we're trying to identify the, the major themes. And the major themes in this opera are, of course, um, the issue of, of being able to use land and then being denied the ability to use land that you've always been able to use. And then this kind of wonderful familial um, reconciliation. Uh, and so the uh, I think those themes um, are something which Tanya will tell us about in her own film. But the one of the things we found out when we were looking at the history of San Luis was that uh, unknown to us, there was an enormous French influence uh, here in the 19th century. And so that led to a rather specific situation uh, uh, between the people of San Luis and the various owners of, of property that has a situation that's gone on to the present day. So I'd like to ask Maria Mondragon to um, begin by telling us about that history um, of San Luis and, and how it takes us up to the present. Um, at the end of our presentation, uh, we will have, in, in this instance, um, I will be texted your questions if you put your questions into the chat, and then I can put them to either of our guests or, and we can discuss and or answer them. So we um, uh, look forward to, to hearing from you at the end of the session, but right now I'd like to turn it over to Maria. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, again, my name is Maria Mondragon Valdez. I'm a multi-generation resident of uh, Costilla County, which is lays uh, 60 miles north of Taos in the uplands that used to be the Taos Valley of New Mexico. We were actually in New Mexico until 1861. Um, the way that this little community got started, it's a, a series of little villages uh, that were initiated by a French Quebecois who was named Carlos Bouvian. Um, and his actual name was uh, Alexis Bouvian, but he went by Charles. He was a, uh, a, a trained as a Catholic, uh, a, trained in a seminary, was a Catholic priest for one year, uh, he had two uncles that were abbots, but what was interesting about Carlos Bouvian, he was from Nicolette, Quebec, near the St. Lawrence River. He lived on a manor, and because of that, he had this uh, uh, experience of, of living in a space that had long lots, which were also called ribbon communities. And these long lots were actually uh, uh, German in origin in mid medieval period. The French adopted them 
And the reason they liked the long lots because it was an easy way to divide the land. So Carlos Bouvian lived actually on a manor in Nicolette, went to, uh, became a priest, left within a year, just said, this isn't for me, even though his family had decided since he was a little boy that he was going to be a priest. So he comes, he, he travels to Illinois, but at that time, the geography, the, the, the states were different. So it was really near St. Louis, Missouri. So he went to this community that was had long lots, the, the, the division of land that were long and narrow lots. He lived there for possibly two years, then uh, went, he was a trapper. Uh, many Frenchmen of that era became trappers because that was the, the way to make money and to expand. And uh, beaver trapping was, uh, was a way to, to create, uh, to, uh, to make hats for Europeans. And uh, prior to this, all of the European beaver, because that's what these top hats and all of uh, uh, Napoleon had a, a beaver, had a beaver hat. He actually had uh, like many, many, many hats. And when he died, he took a beaver hat to his grave. Um, so all these French men were, were trapping beaver for the European market for the elite aristocratic class. And the royalty all used beaver hats. And so the, the how that ties in to where I live is that we were beaver habitat here in uh, southern Colorado, northern New Mexico. All the, the French came in from uh, French Canadians came in to uh, um, the Rocky Mountain, the southern Rocky Mountains because of the lore of beaver. It was a very it was they made a lot of money. Uh, Carlos Bouvian, so if he left when he was 20, he came into Missouri when he was 21, 22, was trapping with other French, uh, many, many Quebecois from French Louisiana, and they were running out of beaver. Basically, they overtrapped. So they had to have a new habitat, so they came into into New Mexico, and that's how they arrived in Taos in 1821 after the opening of the Santa Fe Trail. Prior to this, the Spanish didn't want the French coming in. We were uh, uh, surrounded by the North Americanos, the North Americans, the, uh, uh, the French, and so the Spanish didn't want trade. But after 1821, they overthrew the, the, the royalty in Mexico, the French uh, uh, came in because they, they wanted trade. The, the, the New Mexicans wanted trade. So that's how the French ended up in the Taos Valley more than any place else in New Mexico because we were the uplands habitat. We had the streams and many, many, many beaver. Within a decade, the beaver were all overtrapped. So then they went from trapping beaver to trading. So they brought all these trade items into the uplands from St. Louis, Missouri. And this was all interconnected to all the, 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 the very astute, very educated French people, French Canadians, that came into this, in, came into this, uh, um, came into the uplands. They lived here, and the one thing they did is they intermarried, and so that's what I learned from this whole. Uh, it's been a, a whole year of looking at the French. I was an, an I am an academic. I have a, a a PhD, and my PhD was in, on land loss and on the Santa de Cristo land grant, and my son and my husband and I are have family and we're all interrelated. 
that moved as settlers into the uplands. But the reason we were able to, that people went to the uplands, and it wasn't the reason, it was the push by um, the French to get Spanish uh, um, and Mexican land grants, which uh, were in, that's how they settled New Mexico, is for land grants. The, the issue is with our land grant, it wasn't a normal size land grant. It was a million acres on the Santa de Cristo um, mountain range. On the, on the west side of the Santa de Cristo mountain range, Carlos Bouvian ended up owning a million acres. On the east side, he ended up owning even more acreage. When he uh, uh, died, when he was 64, he was the largest landowner in the United States. And, but he had many silent uh, 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 partners, the Mexican governor, uh, many other French Quebecois, and the one person that I was very interested in is Saran Saint Vrain. So we had all these very astute men, and many of them, which I was a little bit shocked to find out, all had gone to the seminary and left. So they knew Latin, they were uh, they knew French, they learned Spanish, and some of them knew sign language uh, because they were doing trade trading with all the Native Americans. And the this area is very unique because we have the Taos Pueblo, and these were sedentary Pueblo people. And surrounding this a Latino population that came in in 1598 into New Mexico, stayed for uh, um, um, 80 years, and then they were too brutal, as many colonials, colonials were at that time. The, the Pueblos revolted, pushed them out, actually killed 400 colonists and nearly all the priests. And they moved uh, southward to El Paso and the Juarez area, and they founded that. Twelve years later, they come back to reconquest. But when they come back, they some of them learned their lesson. And you couldn't be brutal. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, have a required tribute of the of the Taos of the Taos sedentary, um, and it wasn't only Taos; it were all the pueblos, and they were get, we, they were having them do tribute tribute. Uh, they had to do cornmeal. They had to uh, make blank weave blankets. They had to be servants, and that all stopped when they came back. But this is uh, uh, by the time they came up in fifteen ninety eight. Not everybody was pure European. They were already mixed with, with, we were Mexican Indian mixed bloods. And then by every time they came to a, a location, they intermar, well, they inter, uh, intermingled. And we have all of these mixed bloods. So we're a mestizo population mainly. But we have all of this other blood, and one of the one of the DNAs that we have is French, and it's because the majority of the French were here because of the of the habitat, and so that was part of our story. So, uh, so here this little area is with all this uh, um, um, trappers coming in in the 1820s, intermarrying, and by intermarrying, they intermarried into the largest families. That's how they got a political foothold into this community. And eventually they got these huge land grants that I just told you about, nearly the, the largest property owners in the whole United States. When Carlos Bouvion came within 20 years, he went from coming in with, yes, he came in with money, but he became 
at, in his in his day and age a multi multi millionaire, and so he took a, a, in order to to have the land, he had to occupy the land and he had to take settlers, and so the settlers he took men, mainly in the initially were from the Taos Valley and some from the Rio Reba, which is an adjacent area. And so that's how our families came from the Taos up into what is now Southern Colorado. Um, when Carlos Bouvian went into the Rio Culebra Basin, which is where we come from, there were, uh, me and my husband, there were uh, created seven little villages, and um, he was a very astute person, a big micromanager. He laid out, he gave people long lots, he gave people deeds, and the way they gave the long lots is they paced them out just like they did in, in, in French Quebecois. So the, they created ribbon farms. And people had deeds. They were all in Spanish. And he was a, 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 a previously an alcalde, which was a, 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 like a mayor, but also, also like a judge. So he, had, he became very powerful in two decades. And people had been here for generations. They could never have the power that he got in the short period of time that he did and with a cluster of individuals around him, very astute people that were very educated, again, could speak Latin, could read, could write. And that was something very different than the majority of the population. Uh, um, not everybody, but I'd say very few could were literate at that time period and we're talking 1820 so from 1820 to 1842 he gets this he gets all this money he moves into southern colorado but he has all this he has lawyers he has a, a people that are very connected in missouri and so they make they uh, in 1861 other the before i i should backtrack the American Army of the West came into New came into New Mexico and took over took over all of New Mexico. And uh, Carlos Bouvian was named a, a a judge of the Supreme Court. So he was always in the top top position. But what I find interesting about him and uh, is that he came himself, even though he was. Uh, 64 was elderly at that time. He came in and he brought in two men and he laid all these long lots out and he gave uh, over like maybe 150 deeds to people and he paced them out and they put rocks between each. Tell us about, tell us about to relate it to our opera, tell us about the what he gave to the people in terms of their use of common lands. Well, just like the like a manor in in France, like a manor in in Quebec, he he was the lord of the manor. He required a church, and he gave the church already their their land. He gave a, a mill site because that's what you had to do if you lived on a manor. You had to have a way to give back to the lord of the manor. So you grew food and then you gave a percentage back or you gave them back in a percentage of, of, of your, your crop. Um, he gave, uh, he, there's, when you live on a manor, you, you had obligations. The Lord of the manor had obligations, but you that lived on the manor had obligations. So the, the Lord had to, give you a, a, a safe place and protect you. But you, as, the, as, as a resident of the manor, you had to have your bows, your arrows, your spears. You had to build roads. And if you were too elderly, then you had to pay somebody to do it for you. 
So, so I think we, and in fact, last week we ended up talking quite a bit about about that manorial system. And I think what, um, but tell us specifically about the both the ejido and the the common land in uh, in San Luis and the mountain that was used and allowed by Bobia um, to uh, the that the people were allowed to use that land, even though they didn't own it. Besides giving everybody a piece of property, which is what he did, and a church and a mill site, he gave them two two open spaces. One, the uplands to gather wood, to hunt, to fish. And then he gave them access to the lowlands, which was what we call a vega, which is just a meadowland. You could not have pigs, you could not have sheep, but you could have the milk cows and the mamas and the babies of your of the cows. And everybody got that because that was your survival. Access to the uplands in the good weather and then the lowlands for your animals uh, uh, during the winter. So if you lived on within our little seven villages, you knew where to go to church. You knew where to take your wheat to get it milled. You knew you had a piece of property. You knew you had to build roads. But you had also access to all of this land. And that all worked until Carlos Buvian died in 1864. He wasn't by any means perfect at all. And he was surrounded because of the amount of land that he owned by speculators. And he was also a speculator. He was not an innocent guy either. So he he allowed these people to use these lands. But what happened when he died? Who took possession and what did they do? Well, when he died, he made a grave er error. He uh, he divided the land before he died among his family. He gave a lot of long lots to his friends and to his cohorts and to his fam his wife's large extended family. But he also uh, uh, gave a, a large chunk of land to the first territorial governor of Colorado, William Gilpin. And William Gilpin was a manifest destiny proponent gave it to him as a private citizen he gave after, he paid after. he paid when he died on his deathbed he said i want you to sell x amount of land to william gilpin and then with the money the family divvied up the the cash that william gilpin paid and he paid next to nothing for it i can't remember how many cents an acre so then what did gilpin do with the land and what did he allow or not allow the people of San Luis to do? He immediately started speculating. And he was collaborating with English, uh, with wealthy Englishmen, uh, uh, William Blackmore, who was a capitalist from London and a lawyer. He, many of the, we had uh, um, the military in, that had to come in to be able to settle the land. We were surrounded by the, the Utes and the Hikaria Apache were there. So in a way, it's kind of what happened in Palestine when people came in and occupied. It was a similar thing. They came in, they occupied somebody else's land. And they got removed, the Utes were removed. But in order to do that, he gave a, a large ch chunk of land to the U.S. Uh, military uh, for 25 years for a dollar, for 25 years. So, but then he got it back. But uh, so he, the whole thing was, is to protect the settlers, to protect the, the villages, but then, he undid it because he was surrounded by speculators because of the amount of land, the largest landowner in the United States. So let's jump forward then um, to your childhood, because there's a series of American owners 
And then um, in around 1960, um, tell us about um, what happened when Jack Taylor fenced off this land. Well, be, be after uh, um, Bouvian died and Gilpin died, many other speculators came in, like a whole mirror of speculators. They never paid taxes, or when they pay taxes, they go bankrupt and they'd reform organization after organization. They try to bring the Dutch in, that didn't work. They brought, they try to bring in a German community, that didn't work. So they had all these schemes, but the one group that was there constantly were the settlers that had come in originally from Taos. So here we go to 1960. The uplands was still open, the lowlands were open. When I grew up, we would go every Sunday in the nice weather like this to the to the uplands. We go, my grandfather would go fishing, we'd sit there, wait for him, we'd have a family picnic. The whole town did it. Nearly the whole town would go there like it was a ritual or maybe three months out of the year. It was a community space for weekends. But then when in 1960, Jack Taylor, who was, whose ancestor was Zachary Taylor, the president of the United States, bought the land. He was from North Carolina. And within a, a year- He was a lumberman, right? He was a lumberman from North Carolina. Within a year, he fenced off the land. He got all these lawyers and he tried, he proceeded to do a Torrance Title Act to perfect, to protect his, the land that he bought and to perfect his title. Because when he bought the land, he knew that it came with the, with the, the rights of the people. It was right in the deed. It's subject to the rights of, of local people not to own the land, but an easement to use the land. So that's how I grew up, is with huge common land with a legal easement. So if you live there, you could go, but you couldn't own it, but you could go on the land and use it. I, I mean, this was a mountain. So what was the effect of him fencing it off? You had talked to me about a great out-migration of people from San Luis. We had the largest out migration in the state of Colorado. And was that prime because they were denied use of the property in some, how was that? It, was it, was you had mentioned that the people could no longer gather wood to heat their homes. And, and as we know, the, the valley is the coldest place in the United States on a regular basis in, in, the, in the winter. But even more than that, everybody was sheep men. So they went to the uplands to take their sheep and they did it very smart because we're, in, we're, we're uh, at uh, 7,000, where, where I live is 8,000, I think 10 in elevation. So as you go up higher, you're, uh, we're one of uh, Colorado's five highest peaks. So it's a high elevated land. So they take their sheep incrementally and then they let them graze so they acclimate. Then they take them up a little higher, let them graze, the sheep would acclimate. Then they'd stay up there with their sheep in the sheep camp. So when they closed off the land, they lost their sheep. So all the sheep men went under. My dad, who had a little business, people couldn't pay their bills because they couldn't sell their sheep. We had we we were one of the areas with the big that were up. Uh, we produced the wool for the Civil War, for blankets and for clothing mm -hmm. because of the sheep. So the sheep were the mainstay of the community and for blankets. So, so when, when Jack Taylor did that and when people started going out of business, presumably there's an enormous um, amount of resentment. And I know this came to a, a violent head. Can you tell us about a little about that? Within a year of him being there, there was guns and he was just a really uh, um and this is well documented he was a southern racist 
and he had some very racist attitudes toward uh, uh, Mexican people, people of Mexican descent. And um, and with a southern drawl, he was he, he was just a, an obnoxious. Well, the person. drawl, of course, is not associated specifically. With but, he, that's, <laughs> but that made it worse because that's what got people angry. So he came in, closed the uplands. Then there, within a year, there were three men at Thanksgiving uh, uh, looking for a cow that that got loose. And so they went on the, on the, at the uplands Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. It was cold up there, and they were around the fire. They got the, they found him, Taylor, in there, and and his and his uh, uh, his van found him. They pistol whipped him, pistol whipped him in November in the evening. Threw him in the back of the truck. Drove very slowly to town and told the sheriff, you arrest him. Well, they arrested Taylor and his men. I totally remember it like it was yesterday because we lived across the street from the sheriff's office and Caddy Corner and across the street. The town filled up with men. They were angry. They were ready to lynch him. They threw a rope and the sheriff had to, because he was his protecting him, had to come out with a double sh barrel shotgun and try to break it up. So they took the man to the hospital, left Taylor and his men in jail, and they had to protect him because they were going to they were going to do a man. Now, well, now let's jump forward. Um, we know that Taylor won the battle in the short term after he got out of jail, but in, there was a case, an important legal case in America um, called Lovato versus Taylor, which was initiated, what, in the 1980s? 1990s. In, and can you, can you tell us a little about this and its eventual resolution? Well, um, the only way that Lovato v. Taylor actually happened was because of Hawkes v. Taylor, Pablita Hawkes v. Taylor, and that was the one in the early 1960s. And what's very interesting is that Pablita Hawkes's family most likely were traced to Carlos Bouvian's wife. <laughs> and so that wasn't that was where all of the of 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 the documentation came from Pablita V. Taylor. And what he used to try to clear the title, because we were a cloud over the title, just like a dark cloud. We were the dark cloud over that mountain. And the way he got rid of it, he used a Torrance Title Act, uh, which was a, a very um, seldom used uh, title clearance act that they used in New Zealand and Australia to take indigenous people's land. You had 90 days to challenge it. So Taylor comes in with lawyers, 90 days to challenge. He only served a, a, a 200 of over nearly 2,000 people with notice. And he served uh, the other part of notice in a newspaper of very small circulation in English. So people didn't know what was happening. So that started the ball rolling in 1960. So that case of the Torrance title action and the way that it was illegally done and all the judges that were compromised and that were part of that, including a Supreme Court Justice of the United States that eventually became a Supreme Court Justice. Um, that kept getting litigated for probably over 40 years, that action of Pablita Hawkes v. Taylor. And so by the time uh, um, Lobato v. Taylor happened, this was already uh, challenged in court many, many times mm -hmm. by something like 21 judges said no, they denied it. But the local people said, no, we have rights, we have rights, we know, we have property, 
we have use rights. So we went from this violent confrontation to to a, a continual legal, violent. continual legal. It was and, a continual vi violent. And then in two thousand two, in the interests of time, I'm, let's, I want to get okay. to the resolution so that we can then ask Tanya to um, speak a little about her film. But I I, I think the what happened in two thousand and two when finally. The didn't the it, in the Colorado Supreme Court, what was decided? The Paul, the Colorado Supreme Court said it's undeniable. They had to admit it that there was judicial impropriety with all the judges, with the lawyers that the uh, that the Torrance Title Act violated the Constitution because not everybody was given notice. So basically, they reversed. The decision and they said now you, we have to we reversed it you have access to the uplands now you have to identify who has access so i wrote two expert witness reports mm -hmm. trying to help and many other people did i'm not the only one mm -hmm. and we had the best legal team that stuck by us so this was, there were uh, local people that ended up becoming activists. We ended up having to become lawyers, even though we weren't lawyers. We ended up getting just like totally in, immersed in this land grant in order to fight off uh, speculators. But I should tell you that we have over 40,000 absentee landowners in Costilla County. Uh, we have all these subdivisions. I, I think that, yeah, that needs some explanation because these huge land grants um, were then, uh, some of them were then subdivided and, and sold off as acreages. But let's let's focus for a minute on on still on that, on the, what is it, 80 some thousand acres, which is the mountain, Mount Culebra behind San Luis. And the resolution in 2002 was a court resolution, which said, gave you all certain rights. However, the conflict hasn't really ended with that, did it? Because mm -hmm. um, Taylor, then it, the the land was sold again, correct? The and each new owner seems to try to challenge the same uh, the same uh, court win on the p part of the San Luis. Well, Department. every time an owner thinks that the court is going to rule against them, they sell the land. It's a habitual. Uh, uh, it's, so yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's a pattern. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. have all these patterns with these upland owners. We had an owner from Enron, a Taiwanese uh, owner from Enron, Lu and Lu Pai. And I have to say, the one good thing that I did in my whole life was to find a whistleblower that blew the whistle on Lu Pai. And that's how he was exposed. And this made national. The one thing about this land grant through time, it's been in the national newspapers and we've been called like uh, we had range wars. We had uh, uh, all kinds of violence because now we have a gate that's even higher. It's owned by a billionaire. We have two billionaires in a mm -hmm. county with less than 3,000 people, the poorest county in the state of Colorado, the most un undereducated population, and we have billionaires. Mm -hmm. And it's all because we ended up having a million acres. There's very a little of public lands, which is totally different than Taos has public lands, a lot of public lands. We have very little public lands mm -hmm. because in Colorado, the private property was sacrosanct. And I should, uh, and I maybe kind of in closing, just to tell people how um, this, the conflict is ongoing. Um, Maria's, Maria's husband uh, took us to a Murata, which is a, a, a essentially a lay church for the uh, for the religion in the lay religion in the area of the penitentes and um right next to the Murata has been erected a new within the last uh, what a year, a, year. Uh, a huge fence which um actively prevents the people in the Murata are used to, at Easter 
to processing up the Calvario up on the hill. And this just puts a fence right that disallows that. That's just one of the many things um, which is you're still dealing with, aren't you? Well, they yeah. went to court because of, uh, we're dealing with this. Well, Arnie is, but, you know, I'm the helping to write letters yeah, right, and right, right. behind the scenes, mm -hmm. uh, us and Ma doing bad things, the good, the good bad. Yeah. <laughs> good comeback. The, the, good, the, good, the good kind yeah. of, but we're trying to challenge him. Uh, he lives in Texas. He won't give anybody the time of day. They have mm -hmm. drones. They have um, video. Of, they went to court in September and they had something like 600 videos of people doing illegal things. So, yeah. So think, they were, they're just, mm -hmm. it's, it's harassment. Uh -huh. So even though we have access to the uplands, they, he has bodyguards, they, they're, they're patrolling, and he has houses up there. He gives, he, he does not uh, uh, comply with land use regulations. He just does his own thing. So I think, yeah, I think the, the, the point, the point here really is that this, there's this legacy of, of the land grants and, and this land loss conflict, which is now uh, 160 years old. And even with some court resolution, it's never, it's not entirely resolved. And um, I think with that, I'd like to, I'd like to turn it over to Tanya for a kind of a different story about land loss, which is perhaps a story of, of the movement from rural populations to, to urban populations in Mexico that you and your family have experienced, um, and, and which is in, memorialized really in, in this beautiful film of yours um, called Titiche. Would you, um, would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, should, do you want to move? Oh, yes. Why yeah. don't we still switch in case? <laughs> we'll switch. Okay. Um, okay. For a moment. Um, so thank you for having me here. Uh, it's uh, a wonderful um, moment to be able to also share and listen to um, all of Maria's experiences and um, to gather inspiration from how this community has defended their land and has defended uh, a traditional relationship with, uh, with uh, land work and uh, uh, community building. Um, for me, um, definitely uh, it's, um, it's important to acknowledge that um, I am uh, the granddaughter of uh, the proud granddaughter of uh, peasants, uh, mason and labor workers, and that my generation is the first one that has grown in Mexico City, that has uh, actually been born in Mexico City. I am uh, the first artist of the family. And to me, it has been at the challenge, uh, I think, of a lifetime to um, translate the experiences of my family to languages that um, I can share with others, uh, with uh, the visual and the sound uh, imagery. Um, I uh, have to say this has not always been so. I have not uh, really um, uh, grown uh, acknowledging these roots because um, when my family uh, migrated um, from an urban, uh, from a rural space that is Guadalupe Victoria in Puebla, Mexico, uh, they did it uh, as they were looking for other um, ways to gain a living that were outside uh, rural work and pursuing this little dream that was sold uh, all throughout Latin America, all throughout uh, the Global South, but also in, uh, of course, in Europe and the United States, that uh, um, the future was out of the, out of the towns. The future was out of the rural spaces and that the peasants were a thing of the, of the past. And uh, it was in modernity and in the urban spaces that people could aspire 
to a better living and um, to get a place uh, in the future, no? Um, so, so my family, uh, my mother and her brothers and sisters um, migrated to Mexico City uh, and my brothers and I, we uh, uh, were raised um, very far away from our peasant roots. Um, we actually went to um, this private school where um, I could tell that my family was rather different than a lot of the a lot of the kids that attended there. Um, not only we were um, our skin was darker, but um, some of their ways, their their, their um, daily life ways, uh, were very different to ours. And uh, still, I could not name what was the difference. It was only until time passed and I decided to study film, I um, decided to study documentary film, that I kind of started uh, like looking up uh, at my family's history and trying to learn if there was something that I could uh, take from there and um, make it a part of, uh, of, my, um, of my creation, that I started listening, I think, more and more to, to the elders around me. So um, when I, when in one of the birthdays of my grandfather, uh, I, uh, I had a beautiful conversation with him. He told me that he was very sad um, and very worried that there was no one in our family uh, that would uh, continue uh, with his knowledge and his labor. Um, and uh, I and on his land and and, and yeah exactly land. but yeah. Uh, but especially he was worried about about the passing of the knowledge um, and uh, and I think that was the moment when I told him I was um, interested in doing a documentary film with him so that we could um, we could uh, record his experiences and we could share it with others. Unfortunately, time passed and my grandfather passed away before I could do this film. But this promise uh, stayed and lingered to, and haunted me, uh, honestly, because I, I really didn't know how to make a film about him and his legacy, but without him. And the, there was there um, a, a window of, of possibility that opened to me um, when my mother uh, said, you know, I would love to uh, make a last harvest um, because there is no one else who will, um, who will uh, work this land and will probably, and your grandmother wants to sell it. You know, I want to make a symbolic uh, bean harvest. So I will just put my savings there and also that, no, you can record this, at least it's not much but it's something and so we together along with my grandmother um ventured in this last bean harvest I should and, say, uh, you, you did have some film of your grandfather too though um some some pictures of him in the in the film am i that's not your no grandfather? no 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 that's not my grandfather no it's certainly your, not it's your yeah uh, no 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 uh, i i don't um so what happened then is that my um, my mother led me to, to back to this to this land, and what I had to do was look for um, what was there in this land that could speak of uh, of of him, of his presence, of his legacy, and especially of um, his love to the land. Um, so what I found there, uh, and that will bring me, uh, not to answer, uh, yeah. this, who, this question, who, 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 this, yes. who, who, who this person is, um, is that I found three layers of, um, of presence, uh, there, there were, um, the, the layer of the very small, uh, seeds, seeds and their rhythm and their, um, kind of secrets. Um, 
um, birds and no, like in the layer of the small birds, animals and the small, very small inhabitants, uh, even uh, the sprouts of uh, beans as they start growing up. Um, and also the, the very majestic and um, very uh, gigantic layer of um, skies, sunrise, sunsets, uh, the moon, the sun, no? And, and, I, and I started uh, kind of uh, spending time and listening and watching this landscape and, and I, uh, along with the company of my mother and my grandmother, I started getting some kind of messages messages of uh, the presence of my grandfather. And that's really the belief in the village. And that's really the belief of my grandmother and my mother, is that after a peasant dies, the next harvest is a bountiful uh, harvest because he's there uh, taking care of, um, of what has been planted. So, so I started uh, sensing this presence. And to me, this third layer that will give um, body and words to to his um, experiences was my mother, my grandmother, but also the family that I had not get to know uh, growing up in the village. That's my uh, uncles, my um, my cousins, and in particular one of my uncles who looks a lot like my grandfather. And in the film, we we play a little bit with that, yeah. and we say we say uh, he says actually. I look uh, so much like him. People in the village used to say that I'm so similar to him. I forgot. So, I forgot. so, so that's yeah. a little moment yeah. of, yeah. Um, you know, like yeah. also trying to to glean um, from the landscape uh, all these um, teachings from my grandfather. And uh, really, Titiche, uh, what it means is um, is the is what is left after a harvest. And people uh, usually are let, even if they don't have l land of their own, they are allowed in other people's uh, lands to gather what is left, who, that which uh, for them has uh, a lot of value, uh, as it's for self-consumption, no? for, self, uh, for, uh, for their own use. So the film is called Titiche because uh, even though um, the work of land had finished for my family, we had to glean, to glean and work, uh, and work a little bit around the absence and uh, the scarcity to find the precious seeds that um, that would um, uh, that we could pass to other generations. And this is and this is certainly for me uh, a life changing experience. No, I, this changes the way I view and I identify myself, and um, it defines very much um, the direction I want to keep as an artist and my search as an artist. I think it's uh, in the translation of these languages that my my family uh, speaks and or used to speak. Um, that is my my lifetime um, kind of search. And so when Opera Lafayette and Ryan in particular uh, came to me and uh, um, told me about uh, Sylvan and, uh, and this production, um, to me there was something in the libretto that made me really connect uh, with my family's experience. And um, not only was it the constant threat of losing one's land and being pushed, just like Maria just uh, said, uh, pushed uh, out of one's uh, querencia, no? one of, uh, where, where one has their roots and where one has, has uh, no? like their belly button buried. Um, uh, but also, I think there is um, a, a strategies of defense. And I and I and I really could see the the family of Sylvan uh, building a strategy together uh, to to keep uh, their land and to keep their family safe. Um, so to me, in order to connect to to this libretto in particular, I wanted to to really think of them as land defenders, as people who are 
um, putting the body and putting the their lives um, to defend what what's what uh, I wouldn't say theirs, but what they take care of. And this really, to me, um, uh, I want uh, just to expand for a moment in one um, very um, famous uh, motto of uh, the Mexican Revolution, which is, you uh, know, la tierra es de quien la trabaja, uh, the land is of those who work it, but I would expand it to the land is uh, of those who work it and take care of it because um, it's not only a matter of work it's also a matter of care and I think peasant um, traditional peasants uh, and people who who have uh, this uh, lasting experience with the land um, are very wise in the sense that they know that if they care for the land the land will care for them. And and it's a two ways relationship. Um, and this is very different to the idea of ownership and exploitation um, that uh, modernity has sold us uh, around land, which is, I will take whatever land gives me in my lifetime uh, and I will exploit it and I will keep uh, everybody else out because I what I what I care for is not the land. Is the product of the land and not even the product, but what I can sell from it so I can become richer or I can uh, no, have another um, another position in my life. And um, so to me, that was something that uh, that really connected uh, in the libretto. Mm, so so for for my work in Silvan, I, um, I have been um, gathering uh, these lessons that uh, Titisha taught me. And um, the first of them, uh, I think, is the relationship of men and women uh, who work the land with nature. Um, there is an indiv indivisibility of how uh, people uh, who traditionally work the land um, experience nature. It's uh, in the way they uh, read the skies, uh, that they know that, uh, how, um, how rains are going to come mm -hmm. this year. Of course, all of this uh, is really, has been really put at risk with climate change, no? Mm -hmm. But and, uh -huh. and if I could interrupt you just for a moment, um, uh -huh. because I, if, if people have to go in a couple of minutes, I, I wanted to make a couple of points to, to tie the two of you and your experiences together. And then and oh, if people okay. would like to stay on, um, please, uh, please, I hope you'll finish your thought. But I just wanted to let mm -hmm. our audience know that that um, uh that our this will be the first opera in which we use projections. And so Tanya has created uh, many, um, both uh, and taken some from her movie Titiche, but also um, taken um, many, much film of the San Luis Valley where, where Maria is from, and in fact, from her and her husband's farm. And so those um, images will be um, will be used in our production, uh, which is, is one way I wanted to to connect the, the, the experiences of both of you. But um, for those of you who um, uh, can stay with us a little longer, I hope you'll do two things. Um, one is listen to Tanya finish your thought when I give it back to you. But then also, um, if you'll put a few questions that you might have into the chat, then I'll be able to read them on my phone and then and we'll be able to respond to them. So please, I'm oh, sorry that, for interrupting. No, no, that was precisely right. what I was going to oh. say, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, no, no, just uh, that uh, this indivisibility of, na of the experience of nature um, really has a sensorial, a sensorial component to it. Mm -hmm. No, there's touch, there's, there's the gaze, there's the smell, the smell of the air. Uh, and um, in film, uh, especially in Titiche, we try to do that through sound and through the texture, texture of land, texture of the seeds. And, and that was something that for me was very important for Silvan. 
and as you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the element of projections are um, an ever-present uh, exploration yeah. of uh, of nature uh, in in our production. There's a there's a wonderful scene for those uh, to give away one image um, is when the young couple is about to get married, and there's this sort of the celebratory moment. You see these. Um, Beans being thrown up into the air and and coming down and, and it's 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 a it is a wonderful energy and and to it um, it's been it's great to to for us as musicians and singers to to um, look at what you've created for each scene mm. and have it and work with it and and, and be inspired. Thank by you. It. Thank you. Um... Another of the lessons um, that I learned in Titiche and that, that is really the legacy of my uh, family is um, the dignity that comes with working the land. Um, it doesn't mean uh, that people who work the land um, do not have a sense of um, of cleanliness and um, creativity of their attire and uh, and of of really uh, making their um, their garments and their uh, and their homes beautiful. Uh, their lives are austere, definitely. There are limitations, but um, but there is a sense of dignity and there is a sense of okay, this is Sunday. We'll go to church. We're we're going to use our best galas. Uh, our daughter, our our daughter is getting married. Okay, we'll do something beautiful. We'll uh, like oh, everyone in the community will chip in and uh, we'll have a, a lovely wedding feast. And it won't no like and and it will be bountiful. And and I think. Um, that was something that I also wanted to to bring to Sylvan, um, not uh, to have the peasants in rags. Um, yes, uh, attires that are worn. Yes, uh, uh, something that is um, uh, definitely um, uh, identifiable in terms of class, um, but uh, but to have beauty and dignity um, there. And which, which does add, gives me the opportunity mm -hmm. to make a plug for next week when we will have um, uh, two members of the Taos Pueblo, one Taos Pueblo elder speaking about uh, reclamation of Blue Lake, but also our costume designer, yeah, Patricia Michaels, with whom you've had um, such a nice rapport. And yeah, yeah, yeah. In, Her work in, is in just creating beautiful. these imaginative costumes um, that give, I think, a sense of, of what Definitely. you're talking about. Definitely, yeah. of dignity. And I would also add, uh, in the case of her work, joy. Um, mm. And the third um, lesson that I could, um, well, I, I have three and four. <laughs> uh, third and fourth. Uh, the third one would be the role of women. The role of women in peasant communities. Um, the Mexican Revolution and a lot of um, uh, peasant revolutions in the world have always put the image of the peasant as a male figure, you no, know, like this super strong man, uh, you no, know, like uh, we know uh, about Zapata, we know about uh, you no, know, and Mexican muralists, for example, um, really, really, really put the the peasant the, the peasant as a man no mm. and um, when i when i was first approaching uh, my work in titiche i thought it was the case but as more and more i heard uh, my mother and my grandmother talk about their experiences um and for example no just hearing uh, also maria and her own experiences uh, the, the work for the land for women is double. Uh, not only do they have to, uh, of course, do reproductive work and care work, uh, administrative work, but they also participate in the labor of the fields. My mother used to go to, no, uh, to to help in the fields before going to school. Um, so, so the family is really the the, the unit mm -hmm. of work. Uh, and the libretto gave you this opportunity in a sense because even though it's called Sylvain, absolutely. it should be called Elena or absolutely. Hélène because in fact um, the Sylvain's wife has is is there throughout the opera and sings more than he yes, and, definitely. and speaks more than he and, and is involved in every yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah, she's the real protagonist yeah. to be honest. Yeah. And 
And when you, know, you approach to me with the libretto, if that piece wouldn't have been there, to me it would have been probably harder to connect sí. and, and to, sure. you know, like a, a accept the venture into, uh -huh. into uh -huh. no? Uh, but really the character of Elena, to me, um, uh, is very uh, familiar. Uh, it, it, it reminds me of my mother. It reminds me of my grandmother. It reminds me of people like Maria, mm -hmm. no, who, who really are first in line defending uh, their families and their land. And I think um, that really, really made me think um, about um, all of these women all over the world uh, who are doing this work. Um, as we know, no, right now, there are a lot of um, indigenous lands and uh, uh, lands uh, who, who are being threatened uh, by interests of multinational and uh, imperialist forces. And the women uh, are usually there in the first line of combat. Um, and, and traditionally, they are not depicted as land defenders. I think it's also a lot of um, how indigenous women have taught us to, to listen and to really, really recognize women as them being in the first line of land defending. So, so to me, that's some, uh, also super important, no? Like women uh, defending the land. And the final one, uh, and with this I will end, is the sense of community. Um, and I think something um, that to me is really touching in this in this story, you know, because in the end we see uh, this is the story of two um, well-born um, uh, people who come to a peasant community and who have been welcomed by this community. Um, and why have they been welcomed by this community, whereas perhaps others uh, wouldn't have been welcomed. I think there's a sense of humbleness and gratitude and a real recognition of who the land belongs to. They, they really don't, they mm, might acknowledge that there's a landlord, no? like this, this uh, guy, the uh, French guy, who by means of uh, luck and uh, um, birth, and especially like a fiction, no? like the, these fictions of how people get to get their hands on land. They, like there are there are uh, uh, human fictions that we tell ourselves uh, to to really justify property. And um, and these and these people, uh, Elena and Sylvain, I think they really acknowledge that the that the land is actually from the community. No, they they all they are all the time uh, being very grateful and um, saying how how Basil and his family uh, have made them welcome and have helped them survive. And yeah, I think that to me that's very touching and very important because um, not only uh, is this something that in the past peasants have really uh, organized and made sure, uh, you know, like uh, the community's well-being um, allowed them, for example, for use, uh, certain uses of land that were shared, you no. Know? Uh, but sometimes even, you no, know, like picking harvests, uh, you need a lot of labor to pick harvests, and people uh, can go to my harvest uh, this weekend, and then on to the neighbor's harvest next weekend, right. no? The, the, the way people work for each other and with exactly. each other exactly. on a regular basis is Absolutely. kind of extraordinary in rural, Absolutely. rural communities. Absolutely. It? They depend on each other. They depend on each yeah. other and, the, and they depend on the land. So the care mm -hmm. is, uh, no, like goes on, on these two directions. So so there, there to me is something that um, I think really positions our production um, socially and politically in in a very um, precise moment where we need it. I think uh, now with um, no, um, the climate crisis and uh, no, like capitalism really uh, hitting the wall of uh, how um, there seems no possible continuation in the way no, like we, we exploit 
uh, our world and and uh, the way the way the system exploits people. Um, communal use of um, of lands, care for each other, community as a as a force, and the acknowledgement of um, of of the strength of those who who are willing to to defend mm. these ways. I think it really is a beacon of light towards the future. Um, so to me, there's something very contemporary in Silvan. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, all of this will translate. All of this, um, of course, uh, is very subtle. Um, and especially I with... Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's extraordinary that, that, I mean, we really haven't changed any s significant part of this opera's plot from the 1770 libretto. Um, the, the poetry that you're bringing out of it um, is really, and the meanings that you're talking about, seem to be at one with the libretto. Um, and I, I hope our audience will find that too. But I, we, you know, we haven't, we haven't tried to make a political statement. I feel that we've been finding in the libretto all the cues to to <laughs> do exactly what you're doing. And 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 I think when I you know, uh, maybe I'll end with a funny story for our, our for our audience, simply because um, how I met Tanya is 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 really serendipitous. Um, in that um, I looked online for a Tanya um, uh, Hernandez, and um, who I thought was someone else, and um, and then I discovered this Tanya Hernandez Velasco who had created this film. And since it touched so poetically on these, on these um, uh, themes, uh, both the familial community and the, um, and, and the, uh, the, of the land, um, I sent her an email out of the blue and I didn't hear back for a while. And, um, and finally I heard back with, you know, a certain amount of questions, um, directing an opera and all this. And, and it wasn't until, um, I think we got together the, the second or third time, we were here in New Mexico a year ago, um, when, when Tanya turned to me, she says, you know, I have to tell you that when I received that email from you, I thought it was a scam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but in fact, it was such an elaborate scam about asking me to direct an opera. That, about land. <laughs> about, about land and, uh, uh, no, like uh, uh, family relations that... Yeah. I thought no, you had done a good job at stalking me yeah. and kind of made a really <laughs> so, tailor-made... And I barely look at the internet, so I couldn't have stalked uh -huh. you. I don't even uh -huh. know Instagram or Facebook definitely, or all that stuff. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I just wanted to add uh, just a final, final note. And I think uh, uh, this uh, Silvan um, has a beautiful ending uh, in the sense that... Uh, no, like there is a reconciliation, a family reconciliation, a tender one. Mm -hmm. And um, it certainly raises questions uh, to me, you know, as um, how, how as a uh, um, different, what is needed for reconciliation when we share territories? And I think uh, perhaps this is a, this is a, an open question, no? Um, and I'm, and th this, uh, this is certainly, uh, you know, like uh, the take on Sylvan is certainly um, timely, you know, to the moment and to and to the kind of stories that were told. But but to me, it really um, uh, gives this question back. You know, like, how, what do we need to do um, to recon? Not, no, I don't know if the reconciliation is a word, but it's. Uh, but what do we need to do to live in a territory together? No. What do certain people need to do? And yeah, like what do what does the landlord need to do in order to live to mm -hmm. to live in peace? Mm -hmm. No, like um, so. Yeah, that's yeah. There's, there's much. Much. I mean, the, the, a lot of these late eighteenth century operas are of necessity of a, a pattern of a, a happy ending. But um, but in fact. Um, I mean, an affirmative statement is not so bad in this very pessimistic age, mm -hmm. and um, and if it does ask us those questions and and um, connects us in new ways to uh, to people, um, which I think this project has done uh, for for all of us. I mean, none of us knew each other before 
mm -hmm. on this project, then then we hope um, that's one one step in the right direction. And I, I think our audience will um, uh, we once you once you see this, it'll be a very special experience. And and um, would have been with someone more unexpected if you hadn't um, heard what what Tanya has has told us about it or what Maria has. So. Um, I think I'd just like to thank you both. And I don't know that um, we, uh, Chase hasn't told me we have questions so far. Maybe people are just like, mm -hmm. wow, that's so different from what I expected <laughs> that, that um, I just have to absorb it, which um, of course we can understand. And we hope you'll absorb it with us over the course of the next month. So shall we cut it out at that and, and hope to see everyone next week. Well, um, as, as I mentioned, we'll have um, uh, Gilbert Suazo, uh, an elder from the Talos Pueblo, uh, speaking about uh, a different way of looking at land and, and one that's thousands of years old and uh, uh, from the Pueblo's point of view. And then Patricia and how she incorporates her love of the land, her connection to the land, to her customs. Um, well, someone, uh, someone out there is was 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 happy to be with us. So we hope the rest of you are too. So, thank you all. <laughs>